help me to welcome up our speaker, the president today. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, worship team. And thank you for that last song you selected, Tate and team. Um, we're, we'll be speaking about a little bit of that this morning. But welcome. It's great to see you all. Thanksgiving is almost here. That was weak, weak. Thanksgiving is almost here, right? So we're all getting ready for the Christmas around the corner this Friday night. I know there's a special Thanksgiving meal in, in the dining room, yes? I'll be carving turkey. I give the most generous portions. You can line up. It's great to see you all, all of you here this morning. I have to share with you, my, my heart has been burdened through a, a number of conversations I've had in the last few weeks with, with brothers and sisters of faith. And my heart's been burdened for them. I've had some really intense conversations of young men and young women who are struggling with their faith. And those things jar you, I will tell you. And so this morning's presentation, I wanna grapple with some of those things together with you. I've changed it half a dozen times. At nine o'clock this morning, I was changing it. I wanna make sure I got it right by God's grace to deliver the right message that he has for us. So please join me in prayer, please. Father, we thank you for this beautiful place you've given to us. And we thank you for every student that is here, faculty and staff that is here this morning who is able to attend. And Lord, we pray together that you, Father, would have your way in our hearts. Lord, that you would strengthen us, Lord. We cannot live for you without your grace. And we pray for strength, Lord. I pray for our students here that you would encourage each and every one of them. I pray for our faculty this morning, our staff. Please encourage each and every one of them, Lord. As we wind down a semester, as holidays are upon us, as many questions still linger in our hearts and minds about so many things in our lives and the lives of those whom we love, we pray, Father, for clarity and guidance and direction and faithfulness for you and to you. That is our prayer. Give us wisdom this morning, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. So we've just been through an election. Some of you maybe thought we're gonna get away and not talk about it, but I said, I've gotta, I've gotta mention it. Because this election was a significant waypoint in our country. And a significant waypoint for us. So regardless of whether your side lost or won, I wanna talk about how we react to these things. It's part of a larger question about how we react and navigate our life. So maybe you're on the winning side and you're cheering, you're still cheering today. Maybe you're on the side this morning, and you're grieving, concerned, or maybe you're in the middle and you don't care. All of these things betray something about what we think about life, don't they? How we act and react to these major events in life illustrate sort of the mental maps that guide our, our life, the choices we make, the things we choose to affirm or to grieve over or to be angry about. And I've asked myself a question, not just about our country, but ourselves in my own life. And I've asked this question with individuals I've spoken since that time who are grieving, not about the elections necessarily, but about grieving about life. I had a conversation on this with a young man who said to me, life is hard. and wrestling with faith. So I've asked myself this question, how do we know we're headed in the right or the wrong direction in how we live our life? How do we know that? Right now, nationally speaking, there's a whole group of people who believe we're in the right direction, that, that, the, rights, that the wrongs have been righted with a new candidate, yes? There's a whole other group of people who think, no, 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 we're in a terrible direction now, it's even worse than ever. And there's a whole group of people who also say, leave me alone. <laughs> Don't want to talk about it anymore. But how do we know that these choices we make, how we live our life, that we're headed in the right direction or in the wrong direction? How do we know that? This past Friday, a gentleman called David Brooks, some of you may know who he is, I've heard, used his work before, wrote a piece that when I read it Friday morning, it made me pause. It was called, Why We Got It So Wrong. And David Brooks, I don't know if he's a believer or not. He writes editorials for the New York Times and the Atlantic and many other publications, very thoughtful ones. 
And he wrote an editorial, editorial trying to grasp the national mood. Why are there so many people angry or distraught or sad? Like what's happening in our country in general? And he wrote this, and I have a portion of it for us to read. And I thought, we, this is really important. This is what we do here at Cornerstone. We try to think about these things deeply from a Christian point of view. But he says, well, we all walk around with mental models of reality in our heads. Our mental models help us make sense of the buzzing, blooming confusion of the world. Our mental models help us anticipate what's about to happen. Our mental models guide us as we make decisions about how to get the results that we want. We all have these, don't we? Here at Cornerstone, we call it a worldview. You've heard that term, I'm sure, many times. Or Christian worldview. We all have mental models. All of us have what I call a moral map in our head that guides the decisions we make. Then he said, David Burks writes, quote, many of us are walking around with broken mental models. Many of us go through life with false assumptions about how the world works. I would encourage you to get this piece from the New York Times. I'm sure it's available in our library and read the whole piece. Because later on, he makes this jarring, jarring declaration that many, many times we walk around with these false mental models, these false moral maps of reality, and we crash against reality, he says. And he believes that a significant number of people just after the election have crashed against reality. And they don't know what to do. Isn't that, isn't that a scary thing? To have a moral map in our heads of how we think life is, how we think reality works, what we think we should expect from reality and from God, and then to be wrong, and to live our life making decisions, dealing with successes and griefs, and realize that the mental model in our mind has led us in the wrong direction and we crash. In 1 Timothy 1.19, Paul warns Timothy and actually encourages him and says this, keep your faith. Keep a good conscience, he said. Do what is right and do what you know is right and keep your faith because some have ignored this and have shipwrecked their faith. Paul tells Timothy, literally, we're all in danger of shipwreck. Be careful. I've never been involved in a shipwreck, by the way. I have been involved in car accidents, terrible ones. A shipwreck is different. How many of you have been on boats before? You know, every time I had a boat, I sold it this summer. By the way, truly they say the best days when you buy it, when you sell it. It's true. I have never thought about it once since I sold it. <laughs> and I was involved in a little tiny boat crash, and I am telling you, I was terrified. I can't imagine a shipwreck, how severe that is. And Paul warns Timothy, encourages Timothy, and I believe the Lord through Paul, through his words encouraging us, hold on to your faith. Keep your faith. Keep a good conscience. Avoid getting shipwrecked. Our mental models, faculty, staff, students, are, I call them moral maps. It's our worldview. We all have them. I realize that we don't always sit down sometime on Sunday evening with our journal. Okay, what, I'm going to write down my moral map. Here are the waypoints of my life. Right? And we map it all out. I don't think we always do that. I'm not sure we always sit down and sort of analyze our map. But we live it out all the time. The decisions we make, the things we cheer, the things we grieve about, the things that make us angry how we respond to those things, that's our, men, our moral map guiding us and directing us. Maps are important. Imagine if our maps that we hold on to, if our moral map leads us to getting lost or crashing. Will we want someone to tell us that? 
one of the scary things in the conversation I had in the last few weeks with someone who I brought this up to this individual, and this individual looked at me as if he didn't care if he was going to get lost or crash in his life. And that made me realize that the moral map he's using has led him to that hardness, almost an antagonism toward God or life that I don't care if I crash. I don't care if I get lost as long as I'm the one choosing to do it. That's scary, isn't it? And I wonder if all of us are, have been at that point or some of us are in that point right now in our life. Maps are important. Here's a course map or a marathon, right? How many have run marathons before? All right, only one, good. <laughs> huh. Marathons are hard. I've only run one. I'll never run it again, probably. And I remember having a map. And I remember talking to someone who had ran that marathon and telling, asking this woman, give me your insights on this map. And she would say, well, here, at this point, to this point, it is the hardest part of the marathon. Get ready. And she would guide me through it. This is a great map for the Los Angeles Marathon, by the way. It has elevation, so you know where you're going to climb. And, and what you're going to go down, you understand all these way markers, you know, what, all these landmarks and waypoints and health and all those kinds of things. You want to guide, you want to follow this, don't you think? Because the whole point of a race is not just to run the race, it's to finish the race and to finish it successfully, right? When I ran my own, one and only marathon, and I got to nine, mile 19, I had cramps in my shoulders, cramps in my legs. I mean, I couldn't, I mean, I was in pain, but I told myself, I have to finish this thing. And I literally just like hobbled <laughs> for seven miles. And I found other hobblers, by the way, there were many of them, and we all hobbled this way. And then as I was turning the corner, I saw my kids and I started running. <laughs> I thought, I don't wanna see my kids, <laughs> I don't wanna see them see me this way, right? And yeah, I made it through, but you gotta follow the map. What happens if you don't follow, what happens if you have the wrong map? Here's a gentleman who, Robert, who is a trail runner and went on a 20 mile trail run with an outdated map and was lost for 30 days and almost died. He said, I lost years of my life in the mountains in Washington. Had a map, had a map, outdated map, because the terrain had shifted, there was a forest fire and brush fire, it, it, it raised the terrain, and thus the map he had was no good. And rather than stopping, guess what he did? He kept going. He said, my curiosity took me a different way. Almost died. That would be terrifying, don't you think? To have the wrong map? Or this gentleman who had, a, who had the right map, Mario is his name. He's an ultra marathoner running a, a race in a desert of all places. Had the right map, but the map could not account for sandstorm. A seven hour sandstorm hit him, seven hours. And he said that when he got out of the sandstorm, everything was different. And the map was useless. So he survived on urine and raw bats. Now that's a diet. Nine days lost. Had a map, but didn't help him. Right? The other runner had a map, it didn't help him. And I just want to ask us this question. Students, with the greatest urging in my heart is your brother in the Lord and president of the university, faculty, staff, how accurate is the map we're using to run the race of our life? How accurate is the map you're using? How do you know you're headed in the right direction? How do we know we're headed in the right direction? Does the map of our life, the, the, does the moral map in our heads that we use, is it helping us or hindering us? I say a map in a course map because the scripture that we have used this entire year for our theme of Christ our greatest legacy is Hebrews 12, one and two. And in this scripture, we're told that our life is a race, isn't it? Isn't it? Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. 
One of the incredible things about this scripture and this theme, and we talked a little bit about this a couple months ago when I was here presenting on this, we spoke about legacy. Christ our grace legacy is something we inherit that's given to us, something dear, special, that's reserved just for us. We spoke about our legacy in Christ as an ambassadorship. We are called to carry it and share it. But in Hebrews, we're told to live it. Right? It's a race. We're to, actually, the word race is a contest, a fight. Did any of you see the uh, Jake Paul Tyson fight? What a phony fight. Did, I mean, seriously, if you saw it, I stayed up and I thought, what a waste. I was so mad. Ugh, anyhow. We are, we are told that the Christian life is a race, a contest, a fight. That's what it is. It's not a passive spectator sport. As a matter of fact, if our moral map leads us to be spectators, we've got the wrong map. This is serious business, students. I'm just telling you, urging you, because I've spoken to young men and women your age in the last few weeks, and I, I'm urging you, make sure you've got the right map. I'll give you an example. I have a dear friend of mine who lives up in Traverse City. His daughter graduated from Cornerstone Theological Seminary in the last couple of years and got married in September to a young man who graduated from another wonderful Christian university who is the son of long, full-time ministry people you know, in the ministry. Married in September, November, he speaks to my friend's daughter, his new wife, and said, I'm no longer a Christian. I believe that Jesus is a false prophet. And I think God is unfair and unjust in the way he treats people. I'm not making this up. I triple checked the message I received before I came to tell you this. Imagine the grief of the parents. Imagine the grief of the daughter. She's studying in another, in another situa- school right now for ministry. And the man that she married, who she believed was a walking with the Lord, faithful to Jesus, grew up in a ministry family, went to another Christian university, two months after marriage, says Jesus is a false prophet. I'm an agnostic, maybe an atheist. God's unfair and unjust. That did not happen in just two months. It's a moral map. It's a map. We have these things in our heads, students. Moral maps that we follow throughout our life and our moral maps as David Brooks, who I don't know if he's a Christian or not, suggest sometimes are false. Sometimes our moral maps are flawed. Sometimes the waypoints in our moral maps take us in the wrong direction. And unless someone calls us out or corrects us or we seek correction or we seek clarity, we keep going down the road. We get lost in the mountains for 30 days. Lost in the desert. In real life, we lose our faith. We become shipwrecked. That's serious business. I urge you, my, my longing for every single one of you here, students here who are not here, is to keep the faith. Do not let go of it. Do not lose it. Now, there are other scriptures in the New Testament that speak about the Christian life as a race. It's not just Hebrews 12. You see in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul says to the Corinthian Christians, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize, so run that you may obtain it. Our Christian life is compared to a race. You've got to have the right map. Then in 2 Timothy 4, 6, 8, perhaps the, the clearest declaration of the race, but the map is here. Paul writes to Timothy, and Timothy is his son in the faith. If I can put it this way, Timothy is his student. Timothy is his student. And Paul's giving to his student, his protege, advice. Here's what you should be thinking about. And he begins by saying, I'm ready to be poured out as a drink offering. What does that mean, by the way? Anyone? 
What does that mean? Who, who can hazard a guess here? Students? He's about to die. He's facing his execution. I'm ready to be poured as a drink offering. The time of my departure has come. I'm about to die. So I need to say this to you, Timothy. I have fought the good fight. Waypoint number one. I fought the good fight. I didn't just fight. I've been involved in fights that I've lost. I'll never forget the first time I got punched in the face. Tyson is right. You have a plan to get punched in the mouth. <laughs> and I remember as a kid in the snowball fight getting punched by this kid. And I looked at him and I thought, if I do anything, he'll kill me. So I'll say, I'm sorry. I walked away. <laughs> right? That was not a good fight, by the way. Not for me, anyhow. For the other guy, yes. Paul says, I fought the good fight. I didn't just fight. I didn't just struggle. I fought a good fight. I finished the race. Waypoint number two. I finished it. Waypoint number three, I've kept the faith. I've guarded my faith. I've hung on to my faith. I've contended for the faith. And then he says, because of these three things and one more, at the end here, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved this appearing. That's waypoint number four. I love, Paul says, the reality, the truth that Jesus can come back at any moment in time, and I live in the light of his return. Waypoint number four. If I were to put the, the map that Paul is giving us, the right map for our life, I would say those are the key four waypoints. I can add a few more, but I think these get him. Fight a good fight. Students, the Christian life is not Sunday school picnic. It's a life of, of fighting a good fight, and it's a fight, a spiritual one, of prayer, of obedience, of sacrifice for the Lord and for others. And Paul says, I fought the good fight. I've finished the race. It's one where you persevere until the end and you don't drop out and quit. And you and I are going to find all kinds of reasons in life to quit. You know that? We'll talk more here in a moment about that. And I've guarded my faith. Like, I've protected my faith. It's precious. It's a legacy. i protected it. So life is a race, yes? The great thing about this race is everyone can win. Right? In a marathon, it's only one winner. I mean, you can finish, but you're not the winner if you don't finish first, right? I'll never forget the marathon I ran when I was in mile seven, the guy who won was already like in mile 20. I'm like, this guy's like a superhero. And he passed me, I barely even saw him. Like, he was flying. And I'm like, man, that's great. He won. <laughs> I just finished. But Paul says, not only are we supposed to finish, you can actually win. We can all win. Isn't that great? We can actually all win this race and receive a crown from the Lord. But we have to run with an accurate map. So you've seen this. I've, I've already shared this with you, but I think I the four waypoints, fighting the good fight, finishing the race, keeping the faith, loving the Lord's appearing. We can spend hours on those things, but I would encourage you to write those down. Or remember the scripture, 2 Timothy 4, 68, and, and, and reflect on it. These four waypoints are absolutely critical, and the whole New Testament talks about them. So I want to ask us a few questions before I land on the book of Job. That's where we're headed. Is the life race map that you and I are using bringing us closer to Christ or farther away from him? Because Christ is the most important one, yes? He's a preeminent one. He's a creator of the universe. He's our creator. He's the one who died for us, who will return for us. We're told, keep your eye on him in Hebrews 12. Is our life map bringing us closer to him or farther away? Or let me put it to you a little more blunt. Is the life map we're using, is our moral map, our worldview of how we live our life, leading us to defeat, to quit the race, to drop out, to lose our faith, to say, I don't want to have any more faith in God? or to ignore his coming or hate his coming? 
I'm, I'm convinced that, that some of us in this room are struggling with these very deep questions that we just don't tell anybody because we're afraid to tell people because we don't know how to tell people these things. In the conversation I had two weeks ago with a young individual who said this to me, I will tell you, I was both terrified at the same time and happy. It's a weird feeling. Terrified that this young man would say that to me and believe that, but at the same time happy that he told me. But then I thought, okay, Lord, we can pray about this now. <laughs> we can talk about this. We can share it out in the open now. So if you were wrestling with this, students or faculty or staff, because any of us could wrestle, it doesn't, you, I mean, I'm 53, you can be 80 and wrestle with this stuff. Please talk with someone. Tate, a faculty member, Kevin Hall, myself, anyone, to pray with you and to talk with you so that you stay on course and keep the faith. I want to land here in the book of Job. I've got about six minutes or so. I think Job, if you've never read the book of Job, students, please read the book of Job. It's not an easy book. But the book of Job in the Old Testament, part of the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, is the perfect test case or case study, you know what that is, to address the fallacy of wrong moral maps. Now I will give you, there are three, literally here, three different moral maps in the book of Job that we need to talk about, and we'll do it quickly. But you know Job, you've heard the story of Job, yes? There are four things in scripture that were told about Job in chapter one, that he is. The, the book tells him, the Lord himself says, Job is perfect or upright, blameless, a fearer of God, and someone who stays away from evil. In other words, he's a good guy. What do you think? Think about it. Fears God, stays away from evil, blameless, perfect, upright. Wow, this guy's a superhero. In the pantheon of Christian heroes, Job is there. And I would expect, and I've wrestled with that, that a guy like that should not have to suffer. He's doing everything right. As a matter of fact, he's doing everything that I would want to do to protect my family. In Job 1, he gets up every morning and offers sacrifices for his children so that his children don't curse God and reject God, we're told. Like, this guy is a faithful man. And Satan shows up. And Satan goes to God and said, and God says to him, Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Blameless, upright, fears me, and stays away from evil. Have you considered him? And Satan says this, yeah, I've considered him. And the only reason he's that way is because you have protected him. You take your protection away from him, he will curse you to your face. And God says, go ahead and do it. In one failed soup, Job loses everything. His sons and his daughters killed in a natural disaster. And he loses all his flocks, all his possessions, all his, I mean, everything. What would our moral map do in that situation? What would your moral map do? Hmm? What would our moral map tell us to do, to react to? Job, in the most incredible example, the Bible says he tears his clothes, shaves his head, sits in ashes, and bows down and worships. And he says, the Lord has given, the Lord has taken, blessed be the name of the Lord. And we're told that in all those things, Job did not falsely accuse God. Can we say wow? <laughs> all right. Would our moral maps lead us to that or would our moral maps lead us to become angry and vicious toward God? If we're angry this morning, full of anger, rancor, why are we, uh, why? And why is our moral map telling us that we should be that? So, Satan comes back and tells Job, that the Lord says, have you seen Job? You put Job against me, Satan, but he hasn't cursed me. And Satan says, you know what? There's one more thing you haven't done to him. Take his health. Every man loves his flown flesh. You touch it, he'll curse you to your face. Okay? God says, and by the way, Job doesn't know that this is happening. The reader knows. 
And the Lord says to Satan, touch him, but don't take his life. And we're told that boils cover his body. Have any of you had boils before? I've had one, just one. And it was really small. (laughs) But boy, it really hurt. I can't imagine being covered with them. And we're told that his friends came to visit him. They saw him. They couldn't recognize him. And they sat down, tore the clothes, sat down, and for seven days did not speak to Job. For seven days they sat with him because he was in so much pain and suffering. His wife shows up, and here's a mental model. His wife looks at Job and says, you know what? You're still holding on to your integrity? You're still holding on to your faith? Curse God and die. That's a moral model, isn't it? Isn't that a mental model that we can use? God abandoned you. He abandoned you. Your faith did nothing for you. Curse God. Leave the faith. His friends show up and say to him, you know what the problem is, Job? You're the problem. Because if you really would be good, God would not do this to you. So you must be wicked and you're hiding your sin somewhere and God is judging you. Both had terrible views of God. Both had moral maps that misread God and made terrible decisions. And if you read the entire book of Job, Job wrestles. And he says, Lord, though you slay me, I will trust in you. But Lord, I've got to talk with you. (laughs) Like, why are you doing this? It's okay to ask those things, by the way. And the wrestling match is intense until God shows up. And for three chapters, God answers Job. And Job says, I bow down in worship. I bow down in worship. I bow down in worship. Students, I want to encourage you and faculty and staff, we're all going to wrestle with terrible, difficult things in life. And I want to urge you to ensure that your moral map, that our moral map, that your moral map is rooted in Jesus. And you hold on to your faith. And you finish the race that God's given to you to run. And you fight the good fight. And even amidst suffering, even amidst pain, even amidst things that you have endured that maybe nobody knows, but God knows that you do not do what Job's wife did, which is to say, I'm done with you, God. I'm done with you. I'm done with faith. I'm done with faith. It didn't work for me. This one individual was speaking with the last week. He looked at me and said, you know what I'm so angry at God about? He said, God has not kept his end of the bargain with me. His words, I'm not, not making it up. I've tried, but God has not tried in return with me. I'm done. Students, maybe you're feeling that way. Or maybe you know someone. I want to urge you. Job hung on to God. He clung to him, and he didn't let go. Even amidst suffering, even amidst the unknown, even amidst something he could not understand, he said, Lord, I will trust you even if you slay me. Lord, I need to talk with you. Lord, I know I'm going to see you one day. Lord, I need you to give me an answer, please. And the Lord gives him an answer. So students, I urge you, as you think about life decisions you're making in your heart and your mind right now that nobody knows about, to hold on to the faith in Jesus. It's the greatest legacy you have. Cling to him. Don't let go. Persevere and come to others. Come alongside each other and let's pray for one another. Amen? Let's encourage each other. Let's help each other. If you're struggling, tell somebody. Don't keep it to yourself. Don't make a decision that you may regret and lead you to crash later on. Tell someone you trust. Tell a faculty member, step up and say, I need you to pray with me. I'm really struggling with this. And I know that our faculty love you and will pray with you. I know that our staff will. I know I will. I know anybody will. So I urge you, let's keep the faith together. Amen? Amen. Amen. Tate, I'll pass it on to you.